Greeting and salutations. I am Lloyd, a producer at LCD Productions, and I have come to share this new series of visual audiobooks with you, the listener, the supporter, the viewer. Together we will go on a journey like never before, fly to new heights with Project Aerospace, explore new land and cityscapes with flotations, even change the dimension of time through the power of time-lapse photography from live to tape. We'll even travel beyond the mind's eye into worlds captured and generated through animation from Thermos United Daily Animation Series. As we together go on these journeys filled with photography and theater of the mind, I hope you remember the core belief that we hold, that anyone can become the master of art, meaning that it is not some born skill what makes someone good at being creative. It is the desire to practice and spend time being creative that creates the master. I hope that these films, photography, and stories inspire you to set some time aside and practice some creativity. I believe if we all spend more time creating and being constructive, the world would be a better place, a more friendlier and fulfilling place. Thank you for coming. Let's begin this journey. Hello, this is Life to Tape. We're recording the visual audiobook of the airship, The Golden Hind. This is part eight, and we're getting close to the end of the book. And so let's get started. Chapter 20, Wireless Report. Kenyon exclaimed the baronet. Sir, we'll cut Panama, was Fourth Dyke's astounding decision. We'll carry straight away on. She's doing splendidly shortage. She's doing splendidly shortage of Beridium notwithstanding, we have plenty of fuel, so it's a dash for Med Medilia. How about reporting at the Panama Control? asked Kenneth. I'll risk omitting that, replied Sir Regnold. Being mixed up in a potty revolution is quite sufficient excuse for a non-compliance with regulations. It isn't as if we were bound to report ourselves, as in the case of Auckland. Friends, Dean, you might ask the wireless operator to report us to Panama and inquire if there's any news of our arrival. Last night's affair has given von Sinzing a very useful lead, I'm afraid. Peter hastened to give the necessary orders. Presently, he returned. No news of the hunt, sir, he reported. The Yankee ship made a bad landing at Port Dunson, Queensland, and was totally destroyed by fire. Hard lines, remarked Fort Dyke, feelingly. Commodore Nye is a good sport. I hope he wasn't injured. Far from it, replied Branstein. In fact, he reported to have cabled to Melbourne asking Victor, the Victorian government if they can sell him a Vicky, Vickers Vimy so that he can continue the contest. Good luck to him, then, exclaimed the baronet. And the Japanese? Looks like a winner, sir, replied Peter. The quad quadruplane is reported passing over Calcutta. Next to beating Fritz himself, the Japanese is the fellow I hope will do it, remarked Fan Forth remarked Fort Dyke. By Jove, I'd like to know where von Sinzing is and what he's doing. The Golden Hind, now vertically a heavier than air now virtually a heavier than air machine, was doing her level best to make up for the unlucky count countertaps that had delayed her for eight precious hours. Unaccount unaccountability, the reduction in volume of beridium in her ballots, although the rigid aluminum envelope had not apparently contracted, as resulted in the marked increase in speed. Judging by the time she took to cover the distance between Panama and Nevis in the Lesser Antilles, a distance of 1,250 miles, her speed over the water was not far short of 190 miles an hour. If those two props had not been crippled, lamented Canyon, we'd be doing a good 200. I'm content, rejoined Fort Dyke, provided we can keep it up. If we don't lap Z-64 in another 12 hours, you can jolly well boot me, Canyon. A few minutes later, the wireless operator appeared and handed Fort Dyke a long written message. The baronet's face was sturdy and varying emotions as he read the news. Canyon, watching him, wondered what had happened. 
not that he was surprised. After the experience of the last week or so, it would take something very much out of common to take Kenneth Keaton back. Evidently, our friend Von Sin Sing has butted in where he did not, remarked Forsdyke, handing his companion the slip of paper. It was General Montegram's communication, the press agency, and reads as follows. Hobart, Hobart Tasmania, Thursday. The schooner Myrtle Abraham Prout master arrived here this morning in a damaged condition. Her master's r report that in latitude 43 degrees 15 seconds south longitude 141 degrees 20 seconds east the schooner was hit by a falling object which captain prout sub subsequently brought into port examination showed that the object in question was a airship observation box or basket in it unfortunate fortunately intact and with the safety vane locking the detonation pin was an incendiary bomb shaped with the brown arrow. Experts agree that the bomb is certainly not a British government's missile, and by certain markings on the observation basket, it is safe to assume that it belongs to a German airship. The basket and the bomb are being forwarded to the Commonwealth Air Board headquarters at Sydney. Then came another report. Fremantle, Western Australia, Thursday. Investigations among the ruins of the aerodrome destroyed by fire yesterday morning have resulted in the finding of the remains of an aerial torpedo bearing the British government mark. This discovery completely upsets the original theory as to the cause of the outbreak. Various rumors are afloat, but pending an official declaration on the subject, the press is requested to confine reports to the actual known facts. A further communication will be made as soon as def definite information is forthcoming. Yes, Von Sinzing is getting desperate, remarked Canyon. It is a dead cert that he thought we were burst in the fermental aerodrome that night. But how in the name of goodness did he get so far south? It was reported he went direct from Java to New Zealand, passing north of Australia. He reported, you mean, corrected Fort Dyke, trying to show dust in one's eye is an old trick of Fritz. Personally, I don't believe he took the northern route and that he picked up our wireless announcing our intention to, of making for our mantle and tried to do us in. He's done for himself, any old way, declared Canyon. I wonder if a hun can ever be a sportsman. I wonder, echoed the baronet. I've come across a good many huns during the last five years, but I've hanged if ever I met one who knew how to play the game. Half an hour later, the Golden Hind intercepted a wireless message to the effect that the British, American, and French governments had issued joint instructions for the German airship Z-64 to be detained at the next landing place. That looks like business, commented Canyon. Von Sinzing is out of the running. Unless he contrives to land in Spanish territory, added the baronet, there are the Canary Islands, for instance. He could, and probably will, claim immunity as political offender. I don't think he can be extradited. You see, it has to be proven that th to the hilt that he actually and by deliberately intended to drop a bomb on the aerodrome. No, I fancy we haven't lost our unrival yet. He stands a chance of romping home, so it's up to us to beat Z-64. I'd like to know what that blighter is doing now, said Kenneth tentatively. Perhaps he's within 50 miles of us. Provided he's fifty miles behind us, I won't worry my head about him, declared Sir Regnold. I'm not particularly keen on coming in touch with him on a dark night. He might try his hand at another dirty trick. Chapter 21. Von Sinzing's Bid for Safety Count Karl von Sinzing was in a particularly bad temper. He had just learned by picking up various wireless messages that the cat was out of the bag. In other words, the discovery of the lost observation basket had landed him in a very awkward predicament. He blamed everyone and everybody save himself. The luckiness utter lieutenant, Hans Luder, came in for a very bad time because he hadn't gotten rid of the second bomb. The petty officer who had consequences seen that the bottle screw securing the basket were properly made fast was bullied and browbeaten because the basket was torn away. The rest of the crew, the makers of the airship, and every person having anything to do with the aerial contest also came in for abuse. The Count was also puzzled at not being able to intercept 
any message from the Golden Hind after the one announcing her approach to Panama. Z-64 had reported at Colin when, according to the latest information, the British airship was hard on the heels of the German rifle. And now, almost as almost the final straw, came the general wireless message declaring that Z-64 was prescribed and liable to be detained should she touch any place belonging to either the entre nations. Fortyke had accurately gauged his rival's intentions. The knowledge that his guilty secret was out compelled von Sinsing to change his plans and make for Tere Tere. Whether having replenished fuel, he ought to be easily able to complete the last stage of the round the world voyage. When about 300 miles to the westward of the Canaries, but farther to the north than von Sinsing hoped to be, owing to a strong side drift, Z-64 encountered a violent storm. In order to try to avoid the worst of the terrific wind and rain, the airship began to ascend, hoping to find better conditions in the rare field atmosphere. Z-64 was ascending obliquely under the action of her huge horizontal rudder and was passing through the dense cloud when a vivid flash of lightning followed by the most immediate followed almost immediately by the deafening crash of thunder appeared to penetrate the airship through and through almost every man aboard shouted with terror they were fully convinced that the hydrogen had ignited there was a frantic rush for the life-saving parachutes until Lieutenant Hans Luter reassured the panic-stricken crew with the information that the gas bag had not taken fire. Meanwhile, the airship left on its own devices, since the Hellman had abandoned the wheel, had turned 8 degrees to port, and was traveling now at a rate of 120 miles an hour on a course of north by west. Von Zinsing, who had the wind up as badly as anybody, was nowhere to be found for some time. Luter even came to the conclusion that his poor superior officer had leapt overboard when the alarm of fire had been raised, but after a lapse of 25 minutes, the Count reappeared, looking very gray and haggard. I think I must have been stunned here, Luter, he say, uh, said in explanation. His subordinates accepted that I the excuse without smiling incredulously. He had seen his chief bolting for his very life. He certainly did not look like being stunned. Take charge for a while, continued von Sinzing. I'm not feeling well. I must go to my cabin and lie down. He staggered aft along the narrow catwalk while the utter lieutenant gave orders for the airship to be brought back on her original course. It was easier said than done. The gigantic gas bag was seesawing erratically. She had difficulty in answering to her home, and in spite of the fact that the horizontal rudders were trimmed for ascending, the airship was decreasing her altitude. The reports began to come in from the still jumpy crew. The engineer reported that the aft propeller was damaged. Another man announced that there was a large gash in the aluminum envelope, and that several of the after ballots were leaking rapidly. Further examination revealed the grave fact that one of the propeller blades had fractured and the flying piece of metal had penetrated the gas bag at about 80 feet from the aft end. So great had been the velocity of the broken blade that it had practically wrecked every gas compartment in the stern of the envelope. Unter Lieutenant Luter sent a man to inform von Sinsing he had to do that, although he would have preferred to act upon his own initiative. He was decidedly fed up with his arrogant and craven skipper. The Count arrived quickly. He led off by uh, abusing Luter in front of several of the crew for having disturbed him. Then, on being told of what had occurred, he changed completely round and complimented his subordinate on his seg Sexity. Z-64 done, her captain, declared Hans Luter. She's sinking rapidly. Half an hour, perhaps. We'll find her falling into the sea. We must make steps to safeguard ourselves. Quite true, agreed the Count, although there will be enough buoyancy in that envelope to keep it afloat for hours, days even. What do you propose to do? Throw overboard everything of a weight nature, her captain, replied the other. Uh, Uter Lieutenant, we can empty the petrol tanks once we have no further use for the motors. Meanwhile, we must send out a general wireless call for assistance to all ships within 
two, within 100 or 200 kilometers of us. Count Karl von Singsing thought this quite an excellent idea. At least he said so. At the back of his mind, he had a hazy notion that even now there was a chance of winning the Chavaz Prize. There was nothing in the condition forbidding a competitor. His ruminations were interrupted by the appearance of the wireless operator who reported that both the transmitters and the receivers were out of action and that the wireless cabin bore signs of having been struck by lightning. Can't you fetch repairs? demanded von Sinzing. I'm sorry I cannot, her captain, replied the operator. A useful wireless man you are, comment commented the count ca ca caustically. The man saluted and backed away from the chief, congratulating himself that he had come off so lightly. But von Sinzing was rather pleased than otherwise that the wireless was out of action. It furnished him with a good excuse to put a certain little plan into execution. Are there any vessels in sight? he asked. A lookout man had been scanning the wide expanse of sea for the last ten minutes. Nothing in sight here, Captain, he announced. By this time, the Z-64 was well beyond the storm area. The sea, now a bare 3,000 feet below, was no longer white with angry crest waves, but by the aid of binoculars, it would be seen that there was a long swell running. Then there is nothing to be done unless we make use of the albatross, declared von Tienzing. I will go and look for a ship. Hans Luder and those of the crew who heard the Count resolve received the proposal in stormy si stony silence. They were all recognized that their captain was violating the traditions of the sea and the air by being the first to abandon his command. Of the crew, at least four were capable of flying this small but powerful monoplane, so there was no excuse on that score of von Sinzing being the only man able to take the albatross up. In obedience to the pre prema prematurity order of the crew hurriedly prepared the monoplane for her flight. The albatross, nominally used for starting from and aligning on the ground, was adapted for marine work by having three small floats and lower portions of which just above the wheel baseline, so that the monoplane could be used either as an ordinary machine or as a seaplane. In the present circumstance, von Sinzing elected to start from the air, the albatross suspended by a quick-release gear from the underside of the midship gondola was ready before the airship had dropped to a thousand feet. You'll be quite safe, reiterated the Count. I'll send the first vessel I meet to your assistance. It may be a matter of a few hours. Already, let's go. The monoplane's motor was already running slowly. Directly, von Sinzing felt the albatross had parted company with her gigantic parent. He opened all out at the 130 miles per hour. He was soon lost to sight. He's going east by north, noted Sequility Hans Luder. I'll be greatly surprised if he returns to Z-64. The Count was on the same opinion. He hadn't the faintest intention of flying back to the airship, nor was he particularly keen on reporting Z-60's four predicament to any vessel he sighted. He was out to win the Chavaz Prize. The sum went to the man who succeeded in flying round the world in 20 days. There was no stipulation to the effect that only one airship, flying boat, aeroplane, or seaplane must be used throughout the flight. Therefore, since the goal was within a completely easy distance, he hoped the competition he hoped to complete this circuit in the albatross and thus win the coveted prize. Chapter twenty two The End of Z sixty four By Jove Canyon, what's that over our starboard bow? exclaimed Branstein. Kenneth raised his binoculars and focused them on the dark object in the direction indicated. That, he replied after a brief survey, is a Zepp. There's not much mistake about that. She is also in difficulties, apparently, since Zepps don't generally assume an angle of 45 degrees. It is also re reasonable to assume that it's Z-64, since we know that von Sinzing was keeping a course slightly divergent to ours. The southerly wind was evidently driven her northward. Fortyke was asleep in his cabin, but upon hearing the news, he hurried to the navigation room. Are we 
prairies or good Samaritans, sir? inquired Canyon. Do we pass on the other side or do we stop to render assistance? It strikes me that something more than assistance is required, required replied the baronet. Obviously, our friend Van Zinzing is out of the running. His airship is down and out. If there's any of the crew on board, we're just in time to prevent them losing a number of their mess. Z-64 was in a very bad way. The after part of the envelope was half submerged. The rearmost gondola was entirely so. The foremost car was rising and falling owing to the slight buoyancy in the forward ballots. At one moment, it was 30 or 40 feet above the water. At another, it was smacking the surface and sending spray far and wide. Keep to windward, order Forsdyke. There are men still on board, replied Peter, a dozen more or less hanging on to the catwalk. It will be rather preposterous to get them off, said the baronet. We haven't a boat, neither apparently have they, and I don't like the idea of running alongside a half-submerged gas bag with its heavy swells. There's no knowing what might happen. We might run out a ho We might run out a hawser and take her in tow suggested Canyon. I mean tow her until we get the crew off by means of an endless line. Might do, half agreed Fort Dyke. It would be decidedly awkward if our head fell away and we drifted in broadside into the wreckage. We'll try it. Tell Jackson to get a hawser ready and see there is a slip fitted in case we have to cast off in a hurry. Already several of the ballots that had been sight seemed beyond repair had been patched out, while the fortunate discovery of the two flasks of compressed beridium gave the Golden Hind considerable buoyancy so that she was no longer dependent upon the lift of her six planes. Yet the prospect of having to take on board the eight the weighty Hun crew would seriously threaten the buoyancy of the airship. Luckily, we are within sight of our goal, said Forthag. We can sacrifice a quantity of our stores and reserve fresh water tank. And the reserve fresh water tank can be started too. 250 gallons less of water ought to make a considerable difference. Lending hand, ja Lending hand ja Jackson with the help of four or five of the crew soon made the necessary preparations. By the time the Golden Hiron was approached to within a hundred yards of the disabled Zeppelin, the crew of which, half in doubts as to what was going to happen, were signaling and shouting frantically for help. Rescuing the crew of the Hilda P. Merchant was child's play to this, commented Canyon. Goodness only knows how we are going to establish communication. Her blessed envelope is in the way. Thrice the Golden Hind sailed over her crippled rival. The trailing hawser guided over the rounded surface of the gas bag, but none of the men made any attempt to leave the gondolas and secure the rope. It afterward transpired that the aluminum envelope was sagged and whipping to such an extent that the vertical shaft through it by which access could be made to the upper surface of the gas bag was impractical. Anyone attempting to ascend by that way would almost certainly be crushed to death. Can't be the lubers see the hawser? asked Forthdyke impatiently, or have they all got the wind up so frightfully that they can't lift a hand to help themselves? Get in the ha get in the hawser, Jackson. We'll try approaching a leeward this time and see if there's not got the sense to veer a rope. The maneuver required very careful execution. The Golden Hind descended until her fuselage was but a few feet above the sea. Approached carefully, she had the Golden Hind descending until her fuselage was but a few feet above the sea. Approached carefully, she had to be kept under control to a certain point when they, when way had to be taken off her. She stooped too soon. She would drift away before communication could be established. If she carried on even a few yards too much, there was a danger of her overlapping envelope colliding with the nose of the wrecked zeppelin. This time the Huns showed de decided activity. They bent a line to the inflated India rubber lifeboat and threw the latter into the sea. Unfortunately, they did not take into account 
the fact that the Zeppelin was drifting to leeward as fast as the life belt. When they realized what was happening, one of the crew jumped overboard and towed the line a hundred yards or so away. Now there is a chance of doing something, commented Fort Dyke telegraphing for a touch ahead of Nas and one and two motors. As the Goldenheim passed immediately over the life buoy, a grapple lowered from the part of the fuselage engaged the rope and in a remarkably short space of time, a stout hawser connected the British airship with the still buoyant bow of the German. Fort Dyke waited until the Golden Hind had swung around and was pointing downwind. Then he ordered easy ahead with the two forward motors. This gave significant this gave significant tension to the hawser, which was now inclined at an angle of about 30 degrees. A snatch block with the endless line was allowed to run down the hawser. Now the rest is easy, declared Fort Dyke, but for once at least he was greatly mistaken. The first of the Huns arrived in the bowline on board the Golden Hind. How many are there? asked Fort Dyke. Ve von Dante replied german replied the german holding up fingers both hands twice in order to make his meaning clear more huns emerging from the forward gondola of the z64 confirmed the man's statement one was evidently an officer but his features did not in the least resemble those of count von Sinsing, who photographed had appeared some time back in the illustrated papers 17 huns were transshipped in about many in about as many minutes the 18 was halfway along the totted hawser when the fourth dyke shouted let go the leading hon the leading hand jackson obeyed the order instantly the ring of the zen house slip was knocked clear and the hawser fell with a splash into the sea the golden hind released from the drag of the partly ledged l partly waterlogged zeppelin shot ahead she was only just in time the baronet had noticed a tongue of flame issuing from the center gondola of the Z-64. How the fire was caused was a mystery, since had the Huns wished to destroy the wreckage, they would have waited until the last man was clear of the zeppelin. Possibly the wiring of the electrical stove had short-circuited when in contact with the salt water. In less than 15 seconds from the time the hussar had been slipped of the hydrogen and escaping the leaky ballots was ignited. The aluminum gas bag was surrounded by flames. The heat caused the gas in the still intact baronets to expand, affording significant lifting power to heave the wreckage almost clear of the water. The remaining Huns, keenly alive to the terrible danger, promptly jumped, promptly jumped into the sea. When, with a terrific glare, the remaining ballots burst and the shattering wreckage sizzled as it came into contact with the cold water disappearing beneath the surface leaving a steady widening circle of oil surmounted by a dense pale of black smoke to make the scene the scene of the end of the z64 before the evil smelling vapor had dispersed the golden hind turning a he turning head to wind was over the spot searching for possible survivors for half an hour she cruised round but her efforts to rescue the three Huns were unavailing. The men had either been stunned by the explosion or had been hit by falling wreckage. Among them was utter, utter Lieutenant Hans Luter, who, by resolutely refusing to leave his command until the rest of his crew were safe, had proved that all Hun officers were not of the von Sinsing type. Several of the rescued Germans could speak English, but they were very decidedly reluctant reticent in the back of their minds they rather feared that they were in for a bad time they knew that their late captain had been practically outlawed and that he was wanted by the authorities for having among other misdemeanors destroyed the fermental aerodrome by means of an incendiary bomb the get the rather expected they rather expected that they would be blamed for the acts of their fugitive superior on the other hand, they were grateful to their rescuers for having saved their lives, and with typical Teutonic reasoning, they eventually decided that one way to repay the kindness and to ingratiate themselves in the eyes of the Englishman would be to give away their former officer. The spokesman led 
off by informing Sir Ragnall Fortek that Uder Lieutenant Hans Luder was the person who dropped the incendiary bomb from the observation basket. In the hopes in the hope that it would destroy the Golden Hind. He was, of course, acting under Count von Sienzing's orders, remarked Fortek dryly. Where is Herr Luther? Dead, was the reply. He was one of the three left on the Z-64. And Count von Sienzing, one of the other two? The German airman shrugged his shoulder and made a gesture of disgust. He still rackled over his captain's cowardly desertion. It was long and obvious to all it was long obvious to all the survivors of the Z-64 that von Sienzing had no intention of summoning aid. Eight hours had elapsed since he began his flight in the Albatross. In that time, he must have sighted several vessels since the scene of the disaster was not many miles from one of the great Atlantic trading routes. Captain Count von Sienzing left Z-64 soon after daybreak this morning, mere hair replied the German. At seven o'clock, to be exact, left how demanded Fort Dyke sharply in an albatross monoplane. He was last seen going east-northeast. Fort Dyke dismissed his informant. Fort Dyke dismissed his informant and had turned to Canyon and Branstein. The cunning old rascal, he exclaimed, I see his little game now. He's completing the final stage by aeroplane. I suppose by this time he won the Shavaz prize, but I don't envy him. Will you enter a protest, sir? asked Peter. Protest? Not much, replied the baronet, emphatically. These seventeen Huns can do the protesting if they want to, and I rather fancy they will. There's many a slip, quoted Kenyon. He may not, uh, he may not complete the course after all. Chapter 22 A a dumping operation. The heavy laden Golden Hind resumed her delay. The heavy laden Golden Hind resumed her delayed journey. Both gas bags and planes had to do their full share of work to keep the airship afloat. She was flying low, but making good progress. But little, but so little was her reserve of buoyancy that had their three Huns who perished in the cast catastrophe of the Z-64 been saved, it was doubtful whether Fort Dyke could have carried on. To make matters worse, some of the patches on the repaired ballots had b were leaking, for owing to the heat of the rubber, the solution was not holding well. I wonder if Drake's Golden Hind, when she arrived in Thames after circumnavigating the globe, was patched up like we are, remarked Kenyon. It took Drake three long years to do the trick, and we took like competing and we look like completing our voyage under 17 days. If the old bus holds out, added Branstein, at any rate, no one can say we haven't done our bit. The Golden Hind been a regular sort of aerial lifeboat. That is some satisfaction. I'd rather we did that than win the race. I suppose our passengers won't get up to any of their hunnish tricks, observes Kenneth. Trust Fortek for that, replied Peter grimly. He's had them placed in the dining saloon. Fortunately, we won't require any more meals. They can amuse themselves there without getting into mischief. There's one of our fellows stationed outside to keep the blighters in order. Just then, the baronet came upon the scene. Von Sienzing looks like putting it off, he observed. A wireless from the SS won't wash reported a monoplane passing over the ship at 6 p.m., flying east. According to the position given by Wantwesh was only 35 miles west of Gibraltar. Then perhaps he's back at his hangar by this time, commented Peter. Any news of the others? Yes, Commodore Theodore Nye has been unable to get a hold of another bus, yet although two of the Australian RAF pilots are bringing him a Bristol machine from Melbourne, he's out of the running that he admits, but he means to complete the course even if it takes him six months. And the Japanese asked Canyon. Not a word, replied the baronet. He's keeping quiet, but mark my words, that quadruplane will turn up unexpectedly. If he bus and had British motors, he would have romped home in less than a week. What engines has he? What engines has he? asked Brandon. Japanese, replied Forthdyke. 
passable imitations of ours and good up to a certain point, but give me a British engine all the jolly old time. Although the baronet made frequent inquiries on the operations, no wireless message concerning von Sienzing came through. Perhaps he crashed, suggested Peter. Not he, replied Canyon. That hun's got a luck of a cat with nine lives. He's playing his own game. It is a game, added Brandstein, loading the crap of the huns on to us like a man in a mile race, chucking his gear to another competitor and telling him to hang on. I don't wish the blighter any harm, but I do hope that if he pulls off the money prize, they'll pay him in German marks at the pre-war rate of exchange. That makes him look, that'll make him look blue. Although no news of the concerning their hun rival, the officer and crew of the Golden Hind began to be bombarded with wireless messages from Britons in every quarter of the globe. All were of the most encouraging nature, for the story of Fort Dyke's airship and her adventures and misadventures, all more or less distorted owing to the lack of authentic detail, had awakened the worldwide interest. There were cheery messages from patriotic Britons, incentive ones from sportsmen, to whom the suggestion of a race appealed more to than the fact that the contest was one of endurance calculated to uphold the prestige of British flying men. Frenchmen, Dutchmen, Norwegians, Americans, and Japanese all sent greetings to the intrepid British airmen. Didn't know we had so many friends, remarked Fort Dyke, sportsmanlike of all those Americans and Japanese too, when they have representatives in the show. The Golden Hind was now approaching the regular mail line, where routes to and from the Cape and round the Horn unite in the neighborhood of Las Palmas. We'll signal the first vessel we sight, decided Sir Bagnall, and get her to relieve us of our cargo, the Fritz. The owner, the sooner the better, because several of the ballots are showing distant symptoms of propicity. Five, five minutes later, the airship had slowed down and had swung round on a course parallel to the homeward-bound Dutchman. The skipper of the latter, when appealed by megaphone, stoutly refused to receive 17 Germans. He gave no reason why he should not do so, and without waiting for a further parley, rang for full speed ahead. A little later, a French auxiliary barque was sighted, bound south. Fortdyke made no attempt to intercept her. There are limits, he observed, dumping those Huns on board an outward-bound Frenchman is one of them. Now for the next vessel, three for luck. The third was a British tramp, bound for Monte Montevideo, for Naples. Her old man, although ignorant of the round-the-world aerial race, was in progress or even in contemplation, readily agreed to help the Golden Hind on her way. I'll find use for them, he added with infinite relish. They'll work their passage. Never you fear. Three times I've been torpedoed without warning, and on two occasions Fritz popped up to jeer at me a struggling in waterlogged boats. While conversation was in progress between Fort Dyke and the master of the SS Dio Dionysus, a wire hawser had been lowered from the bow of the airship and made fast to the tramp's after wrench. Since she was steaming ahead in the eye of the wind, there was no necessity, no necessity for her to alter helm. The golden hind pitched slightly, was towed astern from thirty feet above the tramp. As the airship course was almost identical with that of the tramp, fourth deck's con con consciously kept the propellers revolving, since even in the present circumstance, he did not wish to give his rival a chance of gaining a protest on the score that the flight of the British airship had been mechanically aided. The 17 Germans showed no great enthusiasm at being placed on board the tramp. At first they imagined that the Dionysus was bound for the Pacific. Even the prospect of being dumped ashore at Naples was not all that attractive. When they did not make a move, they descended the rope ladder so slowly and deliberately that it was obvious they meant to detain the Golden Hind as much as possible. See though the, their little game examined Fortag angrily, make him get a move on, Jackson. 
The leading hand wanted no further bidding. I'll be seconded by the chief air mechanic, Hayward. He gave a vent to such a flow of forcible language, accompanied by a realistic dumb show, that the Huns changed their tactics completely. It was even necessary to check their Im inter interpreting, lest the letter should break under the weight of so many men descending simultaneously. Then, with a joust, joyous toot on her siren, the hussar was cast off, and the tenturous greeting from the merciful marine skipper, the Ni Dionysus, gathered way, while the golden hind, almost as buoyant as yore, rose steadily and rapidly against the gentle breeze. Two hours later, land, the Moroccan coast, was sighted on the starboard bow. Then, fifty minutes later, Fort Dyke touched Canyon on the shoulder and pointed dead ahead to the faint object rising above the horizon. Guess we've done the trick, bearing accidents, he observed. That's Gibraltar. I want to thank everyone for coming out. This was part eight of our visual audiobook, The Airship, The Golden Hind. The next chapter is chapter 24, Within Sight of a Success. I'm going to start a Half-Life stream after this maybe 20 or 30 minutes. I want to thank everyone for coming out. I hope to see everyone tomorrow for probably our final section of the Golden Hind and for more Half-Life. Bye-bye. <laughs>